Today we have something super interesting, something I am very excited about, which is called Yemeniya. Something genetically new and exciting in coffee, but also something genetically very, very old. Now to explain this, I felt there was no better person in the world than Farah Shabani from Kima Coffee. I've known him for a few years now and his work in Yemen is fascinating. So we drove out to see him, sat down and we had a long conversation and I'll give you now the best bits of that conversation. I promise you this is super interesting and super exciting. Hope you enjoy. To start with, can you just give a very quick introduction to yourself and what you do and how and when you got into coffee? I am the CEO and founder of a company called Kima Coffee. And Kima Coffee works with Yemeni coffee throughout the value chain, starting at farm level, sourcing coffee, all the way to processing, export, marketing, and distribution. For as long as I can remember, uh, I, uh, I have wanted to do something, offer something of benefit to Yemen as a country. That's my heritage, that's where my parents come from. It was going to be oil and gas, that was going to be my industry of choice to offer social impact to Yemen. Uh, with the war, that was no longer possible, and coffee seemed like a very uh, exciting uh, and feasible vehicle to offer a significant change to Yemen and Yemenis, and that's how I got into coffee. Now, coffee in Yemen is is significantly different to almost anywhere in the world. It's the oldest coffee-growing country. While, while coffee didn't first appear there, it appeared in sort of, well, Arabica kind of appeared in South Sudan, but spread and flourished in Ethiopia, but it was really farmed for the first time in Yemen, how, how would you describe the, the kind of coffee agriculture of Yemen in a way that it's different to other countries? When I was looking at what I can do in Yemen, it was how fascinating coffee was and the history of coffee in Yemen that got me even more excited. As you said, it's probably the first country in the world to grow and cultivate coffee. Um, it's also the first country in the world to, at least according to literature, to actually make the coffee drink, right? Roast it and make it into a drink. Uh, and when you come to a cultivation perspective, this is it is very rare to find farmers anywhere in the world who have been growing coffee for six generations, seven generations, ten generations even sometimes. And that's what you see in Yemen. And so you see these mountains of terraces that have been literally developed over hundreds and hundreds of years in order to grow coffee in what is a very strange and difficult and rugged environment in Yemen through very innovative uh, uh, ways. Uh, like I said, innovative ways that have, that have been de developed over centuries. So it, it's fascinating. It's completely different to anything you would see in any other coffee growing uh, country. Now, I've tasted various coffees from Yemen over my career in coffee. And historically, going back, they were often both, um, they were always natural process. Mm. And they were always expensive. But, but compared to the naturals that I was beginning to taste from other countries, they were traditionally kind of much wilder, much kind of fermentier, um, intense, wildly aromatic, super interesting, but but a very different kind of natural process than I was used to tasting from places like Brazil or increasingly Central America. Is, is the way that coffee is handled post-harvest quite different in Yemen? So farmers would pick cherry, only cherry, they would never have washed coffee because water is a problem in Yemen. Uh, throw it on their rooftops typically, or maybe on their garden plots to dry over however long they felt needed to, to be dried. You would have farming animals there, you'd have dust, you'd have all sorts of things that you shouldn't have when you're processing coffee. And so you would get an interesting coffee, innately, clearly, with very, let's say, wild processing. And that's why you had these funky, strange uh, 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 profiles for Yemen, right? You know? funky to some and, and horrible to others, but it was just, it was wild. At best, you would know it came from Yemen, but sometimes you wouldn't even know it came from Yemen. And there was a lot, and there is still a lot of uh, coffee adulteration that happens within Yemen, where they import uh, coffees from outside and they re-export to Yemen. That's part of the reason. There were a lot of big players, incumbents in, in, in Yemen, who were making significant margins, and it was not in their interest to talk about where in Yemen it came from. Let's just say it came from Yemen because it was not actually Yemeni coffee. And the other reason is that the, the, the value chain in Yemen never went down to the farmer. You had middlemen traders and the farmers would go to them. So it was never, and their farmers would come from lots of different regions. So there was no system to actually allow for traceability. We don't have uh, washed coffee, right? So every farmer would dry the coffee themselves. You know, that's the first step. Every farmer would pick and then they would dry the coffee themselves. There was never historically and until now any investment from single farmers because most farmers in Yemen investment in processing infrastructure because most farmers in Yemen are tiny 
if you make 50 kilos, you have nothing to invest for, right? And that's typical for a Yemeni farmer. What you do at Kimra is quite different to all of that in terms of traceability. You're working with single producers, single farmers, and you're exporting that. What infrastructure did you need to put in place to be able to do that? So what we do is we build centralized processing facilities in every region that we operate in. And within that processing facility, we have a team of coffee sources. And then these teams interface directly with the farmers. So we know exactly where the coffee comes from. And we buy fresh cherry at the moment it's picked, right? So we know exactly that this coffee is picked by this farmer from this farm. And then we bring it back to a processing facility that traces back that coffee from the farm that it came from and so on and so forth. So we have very well integrated uh, and, and traceable uh, processing, uh, processing infrastructure throughout the chain. So the bigger reason I wanted to come and talk today was yeah. the recent genetic discovery mm -hmm. in Yemen. Um, you worked as part of that project and I wanna know the background and also ultimately what did you look for and what did you find? We went into Yemen and we said, we need to dig into this richness because nobody has and nobody cares. And if people carry on not caring, coffee might not be in Yemen in a decade or two, right? There, there was a significant move from the farming community in Yemen away from, from coffee for economic purposes. If you look at Yemen's history when it comes to genetics, it played a central role, a fundamental role in shaping coffee Arabica's spread throughout the world today all of the cultivated coffees of the world, cultivated coffees, uh, cultivated varieties, I should say, uh, come from Yemen, right? Yeah. From Yemen. Of course, originating in Ethiopia, but from Yemen. Uh, and so with that in mind, we said, well, let's look at what is in Yemen today. Has anyone done that? Mm -hmm. Not really. Okay. I mean, so let's start a long-term project to really dig into Yemen and see what's there. What does it look like compared to the rest of the world? And is there something interesting beyond that? We partnered with uh, Dr. Christophe Montagnon of RD2 Vision, and he is really, I mean, he's probably the number one uh, coffee plant breeding, you know, expert out there. Um, and uh, we partnered with him to carry out a large scale national genetic survey for Yemen's uh, coffee lands. Uh, like I said, with the aim of understanding, well, what is in Yemen? So the first thing that we found was that all of the cultivated varieties that exist today in the world uh, still exists in Yemen. So each tree has a each tree has a fingerprint, right, on that genetic map. And you have your Ethiopian accessions, uh, and you have your typical Bourbon. You can just see that there's very distinct groups on this tree, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have your SLs, and and like I said, the first result we were saying, oh, okay, the the, the varieties within these groups, oh, okay, typical Bourbon, oh, the SLs, nothing in the Ethiopian accessions makes sense. And then we started seeing these fingerprints that are outside of the known coffee map. Okay, maybe an anomaly. Let's let's expand. So we, we, we did a, you know, we expanded the surveying to cover 25,000 square kilometers, big area. And then we did actually confirm, you know, that no, no, there's something that we're finding outside this, 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 this the groups that we know of in the world. Uh, and then we, uh, we carry out some more analysis and, and publish a paper on the fact that we have indeed discovered an entirely new group of genetics in Yemen. And I say group. And within this group, there is probably an ocean of varieties. Right. You know, what it means for farmers is connected to what it means for the market, right? From an from a, from a economic perspective, let's say. So we wanted to understand the cup quality. That was the immediate next question. So fascinated by the discovery, super excited, then calm down a little bit. What, what's the cup profile like? We put together the largest and most accomplished group of cuppers, probably in the history of, of coffee, to benchmark this one genetic group. Uh, and what we found was that it's exceptional in cup quality, uh, statistically. Uh, and um, from the coffees that we had submitted for testing, it was blind, so none of them knew that this, there was a new a genetic group within this and in this group of coffees we had typical bourbons and we had SLs and we had Yemenia and the top 15 that were selected the top 20 I beg your pardon that were selected 15 of them were Yemenia the top 10 were Yemenia and all of the 90 pluses were Yemenia now in coffee in maybe the last 15 maybe 20 years there haven't been that many giant leaps forward in flavor mm -hmm. we've seen equipment uh, be it roasting equipment or brewing equipment have incremental gains and the last time that there was a big leap or a big shift was uh, the discovery of Gesher, right? W which was suddenly we were starting with fresh raw materials and all of the work we did afterwards in roasting or brewing or all that kind of stuff was about getting the best out of what we started with. 
for, for me, Yemeniya feels extremely exciting uh, and comparable to Gesha in this regard because it is a fresh starting point. There is new beginnings of flavor in those seeds. And, and so can you talk a little bit you know, about the taste commonalities of, of Yemeniya? Because with Gesha, we can say it's typically very floral. It's typically a little bit citrusy. Mm. We can compare them, but they're not comparable. Because, uh, and I mean this from a genetic perspective, because geisha is a variety, yep. Yemeniya could represent a ocean of geishas, right? Ultimately, it could represent, it, it yep. does represent an ocean of varieties, whatever they may be. Well, how we would describe it, a lot of fruit, typically for us, blackcurrant, berry, blueberry, uh, heavy bodied, uh, some notes of florality, typically rose, um, and some tropical fruits. A lot of a lot of uh, the the East Asian clients who who, who would ex who would uh, cup or, or, or try Otemania will talk about lychee or mango. So fruit forward, I would say, as an yeah. overall summary. I think that the first time I tasted it, someone walked up to me and just gave me a little brewed sample and was didn't tell me what it was. Mm. It was that black fruit. Actually, for me, it was like a very jammy, very sweet, mm. um, but big black fruit and, and not an overly natural process. There was tons of acidity there still. Mm very interesting and i just couldn't place it mm. uh you know as i it was the question and they knew what they were doing because they'd sort of set me up to be like here you go <laughs> uh i was like what is what is this because i can't i don't know what this is i'm confused mm. by this cup profile yeah. i'm confused it's delicious mm. but i have no idea what it is yeah is that that's that's, that's exactly it yeah that's exactly it yeah so if yemenia kind of holds the potential for disruption and value that Gesha did. Well, Gesha is a difficult story because one, it, it is a variety taken from Ethiopia and it provided no value back to Ethiopia in its, I guess we can say theft, but we can just say taking it for, for now. And it was tested in Costa Rica and it spread. Yeah. And then the, the Petersons benefited from La Esmeralda producing this astonishing coffee mm. uh, that, that you know got bid up at auction and just built this name and this brand. And, mm. Long-standing value to producers was quite high, whereas if they, if a producer grows Gesha, they can ask for a higher price mm. that is disproportionately higher than the cost of production or mm. the decrease in yield compared to a Bourbon or Typica kind of coffee plant. With Yemenia, how do you think about retaining value for farmers in Yemen for what is theirs, ultimately? What is their right and, and, and how how does this spread and add value in a way that that doesn't result in you know the, the sort of neo-colonialist industry taking that value away capturing it for themselves and and leaving yemen with less yeah so we are putting protocols in place to ensure that yemeni farmers and yemen uh are the primary beneficiaries of this right that they're not left out that, that they are benefiting from what is theirs as you said but because of the potential within yemenia both cup quality uh, and climatic resilience, we are keeping the door open for discussions on how the rest of the uh, 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 global farming community, farmers and the industry at large, can potentially benefit from this in a way that is also beneficial for Yemen and Yemeni farmers. I do just want to talk about climate. Now, because most of coffee's global production came from a few seeds and a few instances of genetic removal mm. and transplanting, mm. uh, it means that we have a massive level of fragility yeah. in the genetic uh, mm. stock of coffee grown worldwide. It is all susceptible to the same kind of leaf rusts or the same kind of impacts of climate and you know all of those challenges. And, and when you have a ton of genetic diversity, the hope is, of course, that you have potential solutions for the problems that we face. And obviously the coffee sector is being driven up the mountain by rising climate, uh, by, by rising temperatures and we need climate resilient plants. Now, how does the climate of a typical farm in Yemen vary to somewhere, say, like Ethiopia or, or Central America? Mm. And do you think within Yemenia or just Yemen as a whole, there is genetic potential for some climate resilience too? Absolutely. Arguably, climate change is the biggest threat facing Arabica anyway, in, in the next few decades. Uh, if you look at Ye Yemen's climate, I think you could make a case to say that Yemen's climate today represents the world's climate, post-climate change in 10 or 20 years time. Very dry, uh, 
limited, very arid, limited rainfall. So if you talk about the rainfall in most coffee growing areas, 400 millimeters. Okay. And if you look at the coffee box, they will talk about coffee needing 12 to 1500 millimeters, right? Uh, but also significant temperature swings, right? Because we, we have high altitude coffee, coffee will grow in a farm in which a temperature will range from 30 degrees all the way down to minus uh, zero, zero or close, close to that. So I think there's a very, I think the climate of Yemen is tough, right? You know, to put it simply. And when you talk about climatic resilience, you talk about resilience, resilient to a range of climates. And I think Yemen has that. It has aridity, hot temperatures, temperature swings, uh, and and that's the next project that we're working on. Yeah. So we're working with Dr. Christoph uh, Sirad, mm -hmm. who are really the genomic experts of the world, and uh, Q Q Gardens, Dr. Aaron, to to put together a study that will look at climatic resilience in Yemeni coffee trees with the primary role of looking at Yemen's coffee genetics now and which genetics display some sort of climatic resilience that can be immediately rolled out to Yemeni farmers mm -hmm. in the short term and thereafter when the discussions uh, 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 take place how it could support the, the farmers of the world or the global coffee community. So b before I wrap up and I'm very grateful for your time is there anything you wanted to add about Yemenia. Yeah, I think the story that we have here, I think I think coffee is a social crop, right? It's what makes it different from most other agricultural crops. And what's important for the world is not just the product, but what is behind this product. And behind this product is a fascinating and beautiful story. It really is. It's a story that's centuries old that involves this group of people, of farmers who have protected this crop for centuries, despite the most extreme and difficult circumstances imaginable, and I know the circumstances then and now, uh, and, and because of their work and efforts, we have something beautiful. And these guys are facing the world's worst humanitarian crisis today, right? And we've discovered this beautiful thing within this destruction, this treasure within the ruins, right? This, this beautiful thing that can not only work to change the fate of them, but can also change the fate of farmers across the world who are going through shared ex human experiences of, of potential you know, pain and, 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 and suffering. I think it's a beautiful story. It's how coffee can really change lives, really change lives of those most in need and offer a beautiful experience you know, whilst, whilst doing so. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's what makes coffee special. So I'm sure, like me, you are kind of desperate to drink some Yemenia. I've had a little bit, but I, I definitely want more. Now, it's not really available yet. That Cup of Excellence auction will happen on the 15th of September. And after that, it'll take a little while for coffees to be delivered and roasters to start profiling them and working all of that stuff out. But I hope you'll support the roasters that, that spend money at this auction and go and taste something delicious. I, I promise you it is worthwhile. But I'd love to know your thoughts. Is something like this enough, exciting enough, to make you spend a little bit more money on your coffee? Have you been disappointed by varieties like Geisha in the past, or do you find them hugely good value, very exciting, very delicious? I would love to hear from you down in the comments below, but for now I say thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.